Good morning, Grace Community Chapel family. Excellent to be back here with you with the daily moment in the Word, something that um, I really enjoy doing. I enjoy doing with you, um, and I enjoy reading the scriptures together and going through stuff. Um, and I've missed it. Um, I've missed doing this um, for the last week because I've been uh, working on my office, which you may or may not notice. This is a different space. Uh, I'm in my basement. Uh, and uh, it doesn't look like a basement. Alyssa really helped me as well as Megan and, and uh, our parents and some other people uh, helping me create this into a much better space. So um, yeah, so i am still got some things to finish, um, but at this point I now have internet routed down into the office and I feel comfortable leaving the computer in here because it's not dusty all the time. So uh, we should be consistent internet streaming without any issue moving forward. So looking forward uh, to doing this with you again every day. Uh, so today we're going to be in Psalm chapter 11, uh, picking up where we left off a week and a half ago uh, in Psalm 10. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the text. Um, if you do encounter any sort of issues with the stream today or the audiovisual, please let me know because I'll need to make some adjustments. So anyways, um, let's start off with the Lord is in his holy temple, which is the title, uh, starting in verse 1, to the choir master of David. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string. They shoot in the dark at the upright. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in the heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves the righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. There's a lot in this text, um, and there's a lot of directions we could go with it. Um, but what I want to kind of do is just focus on the most clear elements of the text and kind of going through and not getting caught up in kind of some of the... Um, Directions I could go. I, I spent some time this morning looking at it, and I went, oh, I could go this direction or that direction. Uh, and, I'm, and I want to just take the, just the plain meanings of the text and really kind of try to break the, the psalm down for you and not chase the rabbit trails that I find. So let's go ahead and take a look at the text. So starting off, uh, this is very similar to some other psalms that we've been reading, including Psalm 3 through 7 and Psalm 9 and 10. Uh, there's very similar elements in all of these psalms of David. They're probably around the same time period of his life. It's entirely possible that this is post-temple uh, construction, but if it's of David, it's got to be prior. So we're talking about temple being his holy temple in heaven. And so that's that's kind of uh, where a lot of uh, scholars would, would talk. Um, specifically, this is similar to Psalm chapter 7, verse 1, where David declares upon the only place of refuge. So when he says in verse 1 of chapter 11, he says, In the Lord I take refuge. And this is the same thing that he says in Psalm chapter 7, verse 1, where he says, O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all of my pursuers and deliver me. This is the very same basis for hope for deliverance in which where David is as the author standing. This is where we find David as we read specifically first in this psalm that he is stating, in the Lord I have taken refuge. Then he posits a question. And if you notice, he says, how can you say to my soul? Now, what's interesting here is that he posits the question to the reader. And there's an element to which the reader has now taken the place of someone who has given advice to him. And so now as we read uh, what the advice is that's been given, it's almost as if we've given that advice to David and he's responding to us. And so uh, what, what was the advice that he's responding to? Well, this is the advice. Flee like a bird to your mountain. For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrows to the string. They shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. And if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So David then poses the question, how can you say this thing? How can you say this? And this is the thing that the, refu that the reader has supposedly to have said. Flee to some stronghold from where you are. Take refuge elsewhere. Don't take refuge in the Lord. Take refuge in something else. The metaphor of flight to a stronghold, which is a word for trust, obviously colors the entire context 
For what can be more than absurd that he has sought and found shelter in God himself, should he listen to the whisperings of his own heart or to the advice of friends or even counselors and hurry to go to some other hiding place? Why should he do this? Why would he do this? Well, wicked men are hunting him. In verse 1, it says, flee like a bird to your mountain. Verse 2, it says, for behold, the wicked have bent their bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string and they shoot into the dark at the upright in heart. Wicked men are hunting him. Verse 1 and 2 gives us the picture of a bird being hunted by skilled hunters. That is, that it's only a matter of time before the bird is snared, caught, and killed. So many scholars will be discussed specifically where this might have been in David's life, uh, that he's encountering this specific trouble. But for me, here are a couple places that I specifically think in regards to this psalm. The first place is 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 14. And this is where David is in the strongholds of the wilderness. That's what it says in verse 14. And David remained in the stronghold of the wilderness. I just realized you're gonna you're getting cut off a little bit in the screen here. I will correct that for next time. Uh, it says, and David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. Uh, sorry, there you go. Uh, now you can see it all. There we go. Uh, and Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. So this is, this is where David is out in the strongholds of the wilderness in the hill country. And it says that Saul sought him every day, but who? It wasn't the strongholds that protected it. I mean, it's God did not give him into Saul's hand. Uh, and, and that, I think, take reference specifically there. Again, elsewhere in 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 20, uh, specifically David says, Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth in the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come to seek out a single flea, like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. This is kind of the idea is that as David is in the mountains fleeing from Saul, Saul is going out and chasing after him like a partridge in the mountains and to kill him and to take his life. Something specifically to note that needs to be explained for us modern readers is that when you look at here in verse 2 where it says they've bent the bow and they've fitted their arrow to the string, you, you don't do this until you're ready to fire. And so the idea is that they bend the bow back, the arrow is knocked onto the string, and they are sighting to see to hit their mark. Destruction is imminent. It, the arrow is about to be loosed. But this is the very thing that specifically would bring the person to the conclusion of if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's where we get in verse 3. Now, this is a clear exaggeration of the issue. It's oftentimes the voice of our own fears regarding what's happening in the world around us. However, it's a short-sighted view. Sometimes from our point of view, the foundations are, themselves are being destroyed. But yet that's not what we see. That's not what's actually going on. Because Psalm chapter 7, verse 12, we've already done this one. It says, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. That even though the wicked have their bow bent, there is another bow that's bent, and the Lord is ready for judgment of man. And we must recognize that however many strong enemies may be coming against and standing against the righteous, the foundation will stand firm, despite the fact that these, these evil people are attacking the foundation, the foundation will remain firm because the Lord is the refuge. This is what ultimately, despite the apparent prudence of fleeing to the apparent stronghold, uh, fleeing from the apparent stronghold of the Lord to some sort of stronger stronghold, uh, while the Lord is, is stronghold is being attacked, the reality of the situation is that David is going to spend the rest of his psalm saying, look, I'm going to stay where I am. I'm going to stay put in refuge in the Lord because that's the only place that refuge can be found. And so we see in verse 4, we, we get a glimpse into heaven. And David says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. He, he, he kind of peels back the veil and says, look, if we're going to talk about what's really going on here, what the real situation is, and, and who's really in charge, and if I'm taking refuge in the Lord, let's peel back the layer of the, of the heavens and see he's in his holy temple. He's in his throne in heaven. Nothing's changed. He's not dethroned. And if I continue to seek in him as refuge, he is on the throne. He is the ruler. He is the most important and most in charge person. And that's where sometimes I think Christians, we, we, we wrestle a little bit because we see the world around us and we go, is God really in charge? Because this doesn't feel like it. 
I mean, the foundation's crumbling. The wicked are attacking the church. The wicked are attacking, you know, in this context, they're attacking David, but in our context, the church. They're attacking the church. They're coming against us. You know, where do we flee? And the reality is that the Lord is still enthroned. And like a ruler that is a dictator, he has complete control. And that's kind of the idea. A monarchy here is someone who has complete control. The Lord has complete control on his throne. And look, look what it says next in verse 4. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The idea here is that his eyelids are kind of closing. They're squinting. He's squinting. And, and the squinting here is, I don't know if you're observing like a really small object, like you're squinting to try to really see what's going on. Uh, and this is kind of what specifically is going on. God is testing. He's, he's, he's observing man. He's, he's watching man. He's, he's intently staring at seeing what they're doing. And he's doing it to test them to see which camp they're in. He tries mankind. And see, what happens is in verse 5, it says he tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Now, there's, there's this element here, which we see again in verse 7, is that he tests both the wicked and the righteous. The righteous are approved, and that's what we see in verse 7, as we scroll down a little bit here. The Lord, the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. There's this, he approves the righteous, verse 5. He tests them and approves them, but then hates the wicked and, and the one who does violence. Now, the interesting thing that you have to understand here is that the concept of the Lord hating the wicked, it's not just hating their sin, it's hating them. And I know Ben mentioned this in Sunday school about a month ago. Uh, in the adult Sunday school, and he's talking about how, you know, we, we use the phrase consistently, the Lord uh, loves the sinner but hates the sin. But the reality is, is that there is an element to which the Lord does love everyone, desires all men to be saved, and that salvation might go out upon all mankind. But if you don't cling to the Son as to be saved, he does not love you. And that's that's the element. That's the element that we see here specifically. He hates the wicked, the one who loves violence. And so he tries mankind. He approves one and, and hates the other. Although in the context of verse 6, what happens is, let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. In the context, this isn't a promise. This is actually David pleading to the Lord for the, let this be their lot. Let this to be their cup. But at the same time, even though that this isn't a promise, this is a clear reference to a sort of judgment that's been seen throughout the Old Testament to those who did evil before the Lord. Something I think that's interesting that's actually lost in translation in verse 6 is it says, let him rain coals. Now, we, we get the fire, the sulfur, and the scorching wind. The scorching wind, obviously, what kills plants and, and keeps it kind of hot and arid, right? No water. Um, fire and sulfur, we, we get that. Sodom and Gomorrah kind of rain fire and sulfur down from heaven, right? We get that. But the let him rain coals. The word here for coals is actually, it's a really poor translation. Um, in fact, I think the reason why they do it is because it's very tricky to give you the understanding of Hebrew um, in a way that makes sense in the poetry. And so I'm um, just going to Brown, uh, Diver, and Driggs, um, specifically taking a look at this word, this Hebrew word here, which you'll see on your screen, it literally means bird trap. That's what it means. It's a bird trap. Uh, it doesn't mean coals. It means bird trap. And the idea here is let him rain a bird trap upon the wicked. And fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. It's, it's kind of graphic here what's going on. is David's basically saying, let them be ensnared and let them not escape judgment. And what's interesting is he's using a parallel to what was said before, flee like a bird to your mountain. And then the people are hunting him like a bird. And then now turn around, the Lord has his bow knocked. The Lord is ready for judgment and he will ensnare the wicked and he will ultimately ensure that they receive judgment for their wickedness. That is a tricky thing to understand, that the Lord will not allow the righteous, the unrighteous to go unpunished. And that's something that specifically David is pleading for here, and something that throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament we see is the case. Verse 7 concludes with the Lord is righteous, he loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. They shall see him for he is. So, take away. The Lord is our refuge. Don't flee to anything else. And when things and people and the world and anything around you is attacking the stronghold of the Lord in whom you are taking in refuge, 
look up to heaven and see. He sees. He's discerning. He knows. And he's, una he's not unaware. And the righteous will be upheld and the wicked shall perish. That is what Psalm chapter 11 is saying. So, excellent to be here with you again today. Looking forward to doing Psalm chapter 12 tomorrow. And uh, we'll be back at that probably in the morning again. And uh, God bless you all. Have a great Monday and looking forward to seeing you then. Take care.